Okay, awesome. So welcome everybody to the GOCC. Today we're delighted to have Ashley Adams from the University of Minnesota give a talk about a colorful Hoxter formula and universal parameters for face rings. Before we start, I just want to remind everybody that of the GOCC's like founding or guiding principles, which are that we're all learning, everyone has something to contribute, and no one has all the answers. In that spirit, we invite you to ask questions either by unmuting yourself or just by asking them in the chat. Alex, Andres, and I will be, so the three core organizers will be watching the chat. So if you add something there, we can interrupt Ashley and ask her. Okay, without further ado, take it away. Great, thank you, Galen. And thank you everyone else for being here and listening to this talk. Um, the name of my talk is a colorful Hoxter formula and universal parameters for face rings. This is a joint work that I did in my undergrad at University of Minnesota. Um, and I will be at UC Davis this spring, but it was joint work with Vic Reiner. Uh, we can find these slides uh, at, you can, you can download them to take a look at them uh, at ashley-adams.com slash papers talks. And it's at the very, very bottom. So if you just scroll down to the bottom, you can find them there. So our outline, uh, this talk is kind of in three, three sections. We have a not so colorful section. We have a very colorful section and we have a comparison of the not colorful and the colorful worlds. In our not colorful section, we're gonna go um, over what simplicial posts are. Uh, we're gonna introduce face rings for simplicial posts. Uh, and a universal system of parameters. And then we'll dive a bit deeper and do a theorem on depth. In our colorful section, uh, we're going to go over what a balanced simplicial complex is, introduce a Stanley Reasoner ring, and then a, uh, introduce a colorful system of parameters and uh, introduce a colorful Hoxter formula. Then in the comparison section, we'll compare the two and then we will we'll give a conjecture and a question. In the not colorful section, uh, a post set is going to be a, a partially ordered set P and it has a unique bottom element, this empty set, and every single lower interval is going to be isomorphic to a Boolean algebra. So for an example, use kind of the motivating uh, example that got Vic and I started on this research, which is the complex of injective words. Uh, and a word on an alphabet on the set one through N is, uh, is going to be called injective if every single letter in this word is distinct. So um, a, the post set of, in, or the complex of injective words when N equals two is we have words one, word two, word one, two, and two, one. So it's injective because we don't have the word two, one, one, or two, two, one, or two, one, two, um, every letter is distinct. And so that forms a regular CW complex. And we can encode that information in its face post set, which is a simplicial post set. By setting the vertices to our rank one elements and our edges to our rank two elements, and then ordering them by, by inclusion. So then we can encode this information further in a quotient ring. So where we take the vertices of our simplicial post set and we put it into and make those the variables in a polynomial ring. And then we want to mod out by the relations uh, in order to really capture this information in this post set. And we do so by taking the elements here of rank one, the warmer colors, and we're going to multiply those together and then we subtract off the sum of their minimum upper bounds. So that would be one, two, and two, one. And we see that relation here. And then we have one, two, and two, one. So we need to somehow capture that in our ring. And those have no upper bounds. So we just multiply those together. And those are our relations in our, in our face ring of our simplicial post set. So oh, before we move on from that, we have a little warning sign here because clearly there's another element that we 
has suddenly disappeared, uh, and that's our empty set. Now we can deal with this in a little more specificity, and we do that in our paper, but for now you can kind of just think about it as we delete this element and then we write our ring. Um, specifically, we have our polynomial and the variables uh, of the faces, and our our ideal has generators uh, yf, yf prime, where f and f prime have no upper bound in B. Um, our second relation is the yf, yf prime, where we subtract off, like we did earlier, the sum over their minimal upper bounds, and then we multiply it by their maximum lower bound. Uh, so what we were hiding here is the fact that they have a maximum lower bound of the empty set, which is just one. And so then our third relation is just simply that. We set the face uh, y empty set to one. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Stanley Reasoner theory, you might recognize one of these relations and that's relation one. So the Stanley Reasoner ring is, is a specialization of this, this ring. When we, when we are dealing with a simplicial complex or the face post set of a simplicial complex, um, two and three are eliminated and we just have one. And that leaves us with our Stanley Reasoner ring. So you can think about this face ring as a generalization of the Stanley Reasoner ring, just as a simplicial post set is a generalization of a simplicial complex. So going into the universal system of parameters, uh, this has been found in other works. So work by De Cucini, Eisenbud, and Procasey um, in their classic commutative algebra paper, Hodge Algebras. Uh, Garcia and Stanton use it in invariant theory uh, of permutation groups. D.E. Smith uses it in sheaves of posets. As you can kind of see, it's used in a lot of different areas. Uh, and then most recently, only a few weeks ago, Herzog and Morardi came out with um, a paper using these, and they actually labeled it and named it universal system of parameters. So we're going to follow suit and call them such. Now, what are these universal systems of parameters? If we start with a simplicial poset and we have the corresponding associated cell complex delta, and we're going to set that dimension of delta to be d minus one, and then and it's going to have a face uh, a face ring to be the uh, elements uh, x f for the faces in delta, and we're going to mod out by that ideal that we talked about earlier. And so then theta, um, theta are these, this universal system of parameters, we're going to label it theta, is just kind of the sequence of elements where each theta j uh, is going to be the sum over, over the elements of each rank j. So if an element has rank j, it will appear as an element in the sum theta j. So let's do an example, back to our previous example, the complex of injective words on two letters. Uh, theta one is going to be Y1 and Y2, uh, because those are both of rank one, the warmer colors, our cooler colors are of rank two, and that is Y1 plus Y2, and, or so Y12 plus Y21, and that exists in theta two, since these are elements of rank two. Now, if you kind of want to think about it as from coming from the complex itself and not the poset, you can think about theta one as the sum over the vertices and theta two is the sum over the edges. Now our depth conjecture. So before we remind ourselves what uh, the definition of depth is, we're going to define a regular sequence. So a regular sequence is going to be a collection of these non-zero divisors, our RI. And RI, these exist in our commutative ring R. And they are going to be non-zero divisors on our R module M. When we mod out by R1, then R2 will be, uh, if R2 is a non-zero divisor on M, then it's R and R m modded out by r1, then it will also continue to be in our regular sequence. So the cruel dimension, our depth is always going to be bounded by the cruel dimension of m. So we, we always know that it has an upper bound. 
and the depth of M is going to be equal to the maximum length of a regular sequence in M. So for instance, over here, for a regular sequence of M, R1 through RL, if K is less than L, then R1 through RK is still going to be a regular sequence. It's just not the maximum regular sequence because R1, because R, RK plus one will also be a non-zero divisor for that and modded out by R1 through RK. Uh, so let's do just a quick example, going back to our previous example, the complex of injective words on two letters. If we take, so we know that theta one, I'm just going to tell you right now that the depth is two. And if we take theta one, theta one is going to be a non-zero divisor on our face ring of delta. And so that means theta one is a non-zero divisor. And if we take theta two, theta two is also going to be a non-zero divisor on our face ring. And this is us viewing our face ring as, as an R module, when R is going to be uh, the parameter ring in variables theta one and theta two. And similarly, when we take theta two, it's also going to be a non-zero divisor on the face ring modded out by theta one. And these are, you can permute these and they'll remain a regular sequence. So that gives us that, and I'm just going to tell you right now that there is no theta three here and theta one and theta two is the maximum regular sequence in, um, in our R module uh, M and our depth is two. So we can predict actually the depth of our face ring um, by the maximum delta, where delta is going to be less than or equal to D. And remember D is the dimension of our, or the rank of our simplicial coset. Um, so it's gonna be that maximum delta that forms a regular sequence on our face ring. So that delta can be equal to or less than the rank of our simplicial coset. Now, before we move on, are there any questions? Because we're about to dive into a little more colorful world. Great. So the colorful section. If we take gamma to be a simplicial complex on the vertex at M, then we can define a coloring on that. And we can define a decoloring, and that's going to be a map which we're going to conveniently name color. And it's going to take uh, the set one through M, and we're mapping it to the set one through D, such that the color of I is not going to be equal to the color of J for all edges I, J, where I and J are vertices of our simplicial complex. Now, a special kind of coloring is called a balanced coloring, and that's when the number of colors is equal to the dimension of our simplicial complex plus one. Uh, when it's properly colored, and the number of colors is the dimension of our simplicial complex plus one, then we call our simplicial complex balanced. So to color our simplicial complex, a balanced coloring would be giving our these, these three vertices think. So we have three, three different colors because the dimension of our simplicial complex is two. And to make sure that every single vertex is not next to or connected to a vertex of the same color, we can color it as such. And that gives us a balanced coloring of our simplicial complex. Now, I had mentioned earlier the Stanley Reasoner ring, uh, and we can define our Stanley Reasoner ring as um, if, if we have a simplicial complex gamma, then we take the vertices of gamma and set those as our variables, and we mod out by xf f prime for f f prime not in our simplicial complex. So we're taking the non faces, the faces that are not contained in our simplicial complex, and we're modding out by those. So uh, going back to our simplicial complex example, we have these variables uh, x1 through x3. 
and we have uh, y4 through y5. Uh, y4 through Y7, sorry, X4 through X7 and X8. And those are our vertices in our simplicial complex. And then we're going to mod out by the non-faces. What I mean by that is X1, X2 is not a face because they're not connected. Um, similarly, X1, X3 is not connected and so forth. So that gives us our Stanley Reasoner ring. Now we can define a nice colorful system of parameters for a balanced simplicial complex. And we're going to call those gamma, little gamma, one through D, where for each of these gamma i's, uh, they're going to sum over the vertices in our simplicial complex who have the same color. So for instance, if our color one, we will sum over all elements who have color one all vertices in our simplicial complex who have color one. And these are actually going to be fixed under the action of, um, of the automorphism group of our colors. So going back to our example, gamma one is going to, so our first color is summing over the pink colors. Our gamma two is sum, summing over the brown or er, green colors. And our third color is, our, our third colorful uh, element is the X8. So what we get is a sum over all the vertices, a sequence whose sum over all the vertices with no repeats of elements. And each one contains uh, vertices who have the same color. So what's nice about colorful systems of parameters? we can resolve our, our Stanley Reasoner ring over the colorful parameter ring. And this col because this colorful parameter ring forms a subalgebra for our Stanley Reasoner ring. Now to remind people what a graded free resolution is, uh, if we have our R being a polynomial ring in M variables and M going to be a finitely generated R module, then an end of the degraded minimal free resolution has, has this form. So we have our module M and we have each of these, each of these FI and these FI are going to be uh, the direct sum of R with L adjusted by elements X with these. So one fun fact, and this gives us the number of copies of each of these R's and that's going to be equal to the dimension of Tor of each of these tors restricted by the, by the uh, vector B. So for an example, uh, our simplicial complex, the colored, our nicely colored simplicial complex, uh, has the following resolution o uh, uh, over our colorful parameter ring. Now we may ask, okay, how do we predict this? How do we know what this is? First, we're gonna take a quick stop off to talk about color restricted sub complexes. So if we take a, if we take a, uh, the simplicial complex, which we have down here, and we restrict it to colors pink, um, our sub complex becomes simply the three pink vertices. Similarly, if we restrict it by our color green, we get the, the complex of four, uh, four disjoint vertices uh, as seen in our complex. Similarly, three is just a lone vert vertex. Uh, gets a little more interesting when we restrict by two colors because we will get the, uh, this, the nice little um, complex here, which is simply the outline of our simplicial complex. And then we have kind of this inside wheel when we restrict by colors pink and yellow. And so these, if we restrict, if we find all the subcomplexes restricted by colors, um, then when we form, we restrict by all three colors, we get our entire, our entire complex back. So how do we predict this? Where do we come, how do we get this resolution? Well, we know the first one comes from the from from uh, from our homology, our reduced homology, uh, when we restrict it by the empty set, we just get one copy. 
if we restrict by the color pink, then what we get is these three vertices, which gives us K2 in our zero homology. Similarly, down here, if we're restricting by, by the color green, then we get a co three copies of K, uh, which we see here. And we can continue doing this for all restricted subcomplexes until we've completed our resolution. Which leads us to our theorem, the colorful Hoxter theorem uh, formula, which is essentially saying that we can predict the shape of our resolution. And that, that comes from the, uh, the reduced homology of these of these subcomplex of these uh, color restricted subcomplexes. Now we've had these two. Can, can I interrupt a second? Just yeah. to so I was. Can you go back two slides? I'm I'm curious exactly where the power of k is coming from. Is that like, is that the homology at that dimension? Exactly. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. So you've got yeah k squared because there's there's three components. So okay. And then when you get to high, when you start involving more colors, then you look at higher homologies. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Can you clarify where? Uh, so I have looking at the bottom. I have uh, second homology of red and green. Uh, why did you choose second homology particularly, and why is it in the first uh, piece of the resolution as opposed to the second? Um, so this is coming from a, um, this is coming from one, the theorem and two, a calculation done by Macaulay too. Um, and so, um, this somehow sits here in, in the first homology. So a comparison, when we have the not colorful, and the colorful um, worlds. Uh, let's remind ourselves, we have a cell complex delta, and we have a balanced simplicial complex gamma. And then they both have different face rings. We've got K of delta, and we have our, our um, Stanley Reisner ring. And then we have our system of parameters, and this one is our, our universal system of parameters and that one sums over the element the uh, elements of each um, of each dimension and or each rank in our simplicial poset and then we have the colorful system of parameters which sums over each of the colors i for each of these gamma i's and then we have our parameter rings uh, which are just these polynomial rings that are that are generated by our, either our universal system of parameters or our colorful system of parameters. So these are our two worlds we have going on. Now we have two punchlines since we have two different worlds. Uh, our, stand, our, our face ring can be finitely generated as a K theta module and our, our Stanley Reisner ring can also be finitely generated as a, as we've already seen, as a um, as a uh, K uh, gamma, hmm, K little gamma module. And we can write down a finite, re finite minimal free resolution for both of these rings over their uh, respective parameter rings. So in the end of the degraded resolution, uh, as we've seen before, we have this system going on here, this resolution. Now we can kind of restrict it under this map, which I put in parentheses because there's secretly some Hilbert series computations going on in here. Um, but what you can think of it essentially is as you're sending these, these uh, gamma i, uh, gamma sub i, so each color i to their power. So uh, little gamma sub i goes to gamma sub i. And what that actually gives us is this zero, one, two, three. And so this gives us our, our singly graded versions. And so 
what we get here is we're adjusting by one because we've sent one up two, we've sent two up. One, two, one plus two is three. So we have here, two plus three is five. So we have that there. And then one plus two plus three is six. Great, we're doing great math here. Now, this should look familiar as we saw before. And what we're getting is these, as we've seen our sums uh, are, uh, we're adjusting by the singly graded are the sums of the of our colors and this seems to always happen so one thing before we dive into our conjecture is that the barycentric subdivision of a balanced simplicial complex is or sorry the barycentric subdivision of a cell complex is always going to be a balanced simplicial complex and as we see here our our nice simplicial complex we've been working with is actually this the subdivision of a of a cell complex which is written below and not only that there's a nice way to relate these two things because we're taking our three vertices and colored in pink and they're being sent to uh the the elements who have been colored pink in our simplicial our, our simplicial complex these edges here are being sent to the colors green which are actually the very centers of the edges uh, in our cell complex. And the, the face, uh, the face Y8 is being sent to its very center, which is the yellow there. So these are how these kind of two things relate. And there's actually even a natural K vector space isomorphism between these two. This is, this is, this is very uh, well defined because we can send these, we can always send a face to its very center. Uh, and that gives us our, our isomorphism between um, our, our face ring of our cell complex and its subdivision Stanley Reisner ring. I think I mostly understand, but can you quickly remind me what the um, barycentric subdivision of a cell complex is? Yeah, yeah. So um, the best way to say it here is essentially uh, you take every, every face and you can uh, stick a point in it. And from those points, we, um, we end up, we divide it into its, its individual cells. So uh, as we've seen here, we can take a, uh, a point, oops, here's my laser. So we, if, we bear, uh, if we subdivide each of these edges, we do so by, by putting a vertex in between them and then um, and then connecting all the edges, which are con still contained in a face in our cell complex and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Great. So now we have these two nicely defined things and we know they, they relate, they relate topologically, they relate in this K vector space isomorphism. So what happens when we define them both over there, um, over these parameter rings? Like how, how do these things relate? And we've been noticing that they have the same resolutions. Um, now, our conjecture is a bit lighter than saying these two things have the same resolution because we're not quite sure of that yet. But previously, we were talking about how we can sum these colors. Um, and those, the sums of the, of the colors that we've restricted by are what are giving us this, 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 this tour. And so this is our conjecture, is that we can predict these shapes by the sum of the elements in our coloring sets when we restrict our, our complex to that colored set. Now we have a little bit of evidence. So the conjecture is true when our simplicial complex is cone Macaulay. It's also true when it's a one-dimensional cell complex. So that means it's, it's a graph. It's a graph with um, multiple edges, um, but we don't allow self loops. And then we also know that we have an upper bound. So it's, it's, it's bounded above by the dimension of, of our tour of our complex. Now, our story gets even a little bit better. So as I was saying, these resolutions seem to be the same. Um, and so if we, if we have this polynomial ring of yfs for our fs in our complex, then we can think of our universal system of parameters and our colorful system of parameters 
as generating the same subalgebra. Then um, a question was proposed by um, Satoshi Murai to us that are these actually going to be isomorphic? Our evidence shows, our evidence is simply that we haven't found a counterexample. So that is all I have for you today. Thank you for listening. And you can find uh, the paper here um, at this archive link. Oh, thank you so much for that awesome talk. Let's thank the speaker I, I, with our clap emoji or by actual clapping. So I don't About. think there are any questions in the chat, but maybe there are questions that people have um, that they want to yes, ask. Yes, I, I have a question, um, hi Ashley. So I wanted to ask you what, what happens or do you know how the resolution changes if you change the coloring uh, slightly. So in your example, for instance, if the last point on the left, uh, you, you could color that uh, yellow, for instance. Do you know what would happen with the res resolution? So are oh. you saying if I take um, this complex and color this point yellow? Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, that's, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that off off hand. Um, yeah, so I, I I actually don't know how that would affect how that would affect it. Um, we lose we lose this this uh, isomorphism here, but um, mm -hmm. when when we do that, uh, so I'm I'm not sure how they would then relate after that. I don't know. Does Vic do Vic do you have a better answer than that? I mean, I think it can change it a lot because it changes the structure of these color selected sub complexes when you take one vertex and put it into a different color. So yeah. I think in principle, it could be very drastic, the changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Great question. Thank you. So uh, one one thing from like way at the beginning is um, you had um, you were when you defined this you said that two of the um, like everything but the first relation goes away when you're working with simplicial complexes. Yeah. And I was just wanted to like wonder if you could justify that. Maybe I haven't thought about exactly what simplicial complexes look like in this case, but why would they never have upper bounds? Um, yeah, yeah, no, great question. Um, let's see if I can show you here. So, um, yeah, so let's see if, um, yeah. Yeah, so then if I take a, so say I just have the, the simplicial complex, uh, Will that be sufficient? Probably not. Um, so say I have this simplicial complex, right? Okay. Then and is um, that is that two dimensional or one dimensional? Yeah. So 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 there the inside is not colored. It is just a graph. Okay. Yeah. So then we have. Yeah. So um. So sorry. So then we have. Okay. Uh, K x1, x2, x3 for our vertices. And then our, we're modding out by the non faces. So x1, x2, x3 is a non face um, in our simplicial complex here. Um, although, what might be a better example here, I should not have done that. I'm sorry. Let's see. Yeah. Here we go. This will show my point here. Yeah, so then um, our simplicial complex here will have um, x1, x3, uh, x1, x4, and then x2, x3, and x2, x4. Um, so when we mod out by these relations, um, this will be our Stanley Reisner ring for this element, but what you're seem to be asking, correct me if you're wrong, is that the 
face post set of this element will be one, two, three, four with the bottom element. And then we have one, two, and one, three are our only faces. So we've got this post set here. Yeah. Or one, one, two, and three, four, or? Yes, sorry. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. Great, yeah. I thought that looked weird. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and this, is, this is our face post set. Um, so then if we simply write down our simplicial complex based on this post set, what we're then doing is we're actually writing down not the Stanley reasoning of our simplicial complex, but what we're actually writing down is then the um, simple, the Stanley Reasoner ring of our, of the barycentric, uh, sorry, of the order complex of our ring. So because we're getting the, um, because if we then define uh, a simplicial complex based on the chains in our post set, we get an order complex. And so those two rings will be different. So the idea is that it's not that you're necessarily taking the Stanley Reasoner ring of a simplicial complex. You're taking like, there's two different post sets one that that they give you different um, um so ideals uh, so if you just take the stand if you take these re these relations on a simplicial complex yeah. these last elements are always going to be zero okay so um yeah does that clarify it? I feel like I didn't do a good job of it. It's, I think that I'd have to like look a little bit more at exactly what the definition is in my own time at some point. So it's okay. It, it, it was helpful, I think, but. Yeah, we talk about it a little bit in the second page of our paper, if you wanted to go take a look at that. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker again. Now we can go, I'll end the recording. We can go to special secret unofficial question time. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, it was a great talk. <laughs>